Today's video is brought to you by Babbel. To put it simply, there are very few things in life that are guaranteed. The first is death, the next are taxes, and the third is if you mispronounce a word in a YouTube video, people will leave comments reminding you until the end of time. But that's okay, because if there's something I've learned from being someone who mispronounces things on the internet, it's that language is one of those things that you truly never stop learning. So why not learn a second one? With Babbel's curriculum, they can get you speaking a new language within as little as three weeks, and 15 hours in their app has been shown through various efficacy studies to be equivalent to a full college semester. According to the most recent statistics, the average person spends around three hours on their phone every single day. So there's really no reason to think that learning a new language is out of reach at all anymore. And you see, the key to learning a new language is speaking a new language, which is why Babbel caters their lessons to real-life conversation and why they get you speaking from the very beginning. And when it comes to learning anything, úsalo o piérdelo. Si quieres aprender algo, debes practicar. Y con el año nuevo, es un tiempo perfecto para aprender un idioma nuevo. So rather than take on any kind of student loan to learn a language, you can instead get a link in the description of this video to receive a 60% off your Babbel subscription. Courtesy of Babbel to viewers of this channel, risk-free. Because with Babbel, they offer a 20-day guarantee because they know their curriculum will put you on the right track. So gracias otra vez to Babbel for making this video possible. No matter where you live, some crime is going to be an inevitability. And while crime overall is rarer in places like Antarctica, it's definitely not an exception to this rule. In this isolated and cold environment, there's little use for money, so it's very uncommon for there to be any sort of theft or robbery. On the other hand, however, isolation in such a remote place is known to have some highly negative psychological effects often leading to individuals committing an act that they would otherwise never do. According to psychologist Peter Sudfeld of the University of British Columbia, living at a research station in Antarctica could be incredibly stressful. If you're stuck there with somebody you really can't stand, too bad. You're stuck with them. And if you're missing somebody who's far away, too bad. You're stuck without them. Some people thrive by developing a sense of solidarity and teamwork. Others may become depressed and change their behavior. To quote an article from Canadian Geographic, Antarctic stations can be a dull place to live. They're designed to minimize construction costs rather than keep people amused, interested, and comfortable. And extreme weather can make stepping outside for a change of scenery difficult, dangerous, or impossible. In one notable example from 1959, a fight broke out at the Vostok Research Center between two individuals over a game of chess. This caused one individual to attack the other with an ice axe. And as is commonplace with these incidents in Antarctica, the details are murky. Some sources say the attack was fatal, while others say it was not. After a KGB investigation, chess was subsequently banned in all Russian stations on the continent. It seems that this remote environment is known for testing an individual's morality. To quote one article from the Spokesman Review, Finn Ron, a Norwegian immigrant who was the leader of a private American winter expedition to Stonington Island, barely escaped being killed in the 1940s, according to the group's doctor. Dr. Don McLean, frustrated with Ron's authoritarianism and iron discipline, barely restrained himself from pushing Ron off a cliff when the two of them inspected bird's nests on a nearby island. He was quoted as saying, I never came so close to killing anybody in my life. Similarly, during the 1950s, a resident of Australia's Mawson base in Antarctica had become so deranged and violent, he essentially had to spend the winter locked inside that facility's storage room. With little to keep the mind entertained, problems such as alcoholism are commonplace on the continent. 
occasionally leading to violence in other situations that would have normally been averted sober. Within a health and safety audit of the Arctic program in 2015, it was estimated that 60 to 75% of all disciplinary action within the stations was related to alcohol misuse, where NSF officials acknowledged that the abuse of the substance on the continent had led to fights, indecent exposure, and employees often arriving to their jobs under the influence. But this isn't just limited to American research stations either. In 2009, video surfaced online from the Sajon station of South Korea. Within the footage, it shows a drunken station worker attacking a chef until the colleague steps in to break it up. This employee was obviously fired. But perhaps the most infamous example of a drunken rage at an Arctic station came from 2018, when an intoxicated 54-year-old electrical engineer named Sergei Savitsky stabbed 52-year-old welder Oleg Belaguzov after an emotional breakdown. The cause of this outburst? Oleg had been allegedly spoiling the ends of books Sergei had been checking out from the station's library. As a result, Oleg would be sent to a hospital in Chile where he would go on to recover from the attack. Surprisingly, Oleg would forgive his attacker legally. Within neuroscientific literature, the link between isolation and cognitive decline is more than just speculation. Isolation often precedes cognitive decline for individuals who are elderly and alone. And in a variety of other studies, it has been shown that there are physiological changes to the brain's structure. Within one study that followed a crew of nine stationed in the Antarctic, they found that within 14 months, an average volume loss of 7.2% was noted within the hippocampus of each of the crew. For reference, the hippocampus is associated with spatial memory, learning, and general long-term memory. Individuals who have damage or atrophy to the hippocampus often display mood dysfunction, they have difficulty storing memories, they may get lost in familiar areas, and additionally, they may have problems following directions, and they are noted to also have issues with key decision-making. Generally speaking, you'd only expect to see changes this drastic in individuals suffering from something like Alzheimer's or PTSD, which makes these results rather shocking as it highlights the required mental fortitude to endure assignments in the Antarctic. And for some, the circumstances are just simply too much. The original Almirante Brown station on the Khatri Peninsula was burned down in 1984 by the station's doctor after he was ordered to stay for the winter. While details are sparse, this protest was apparently not well thought out, and it seemed to put the entire group in harm's way, had it not been for the aptly named ship, Hero, and its crew rescuing the group, their act of rebellion would have likely been their last. When it comes to pressing charges for a crime in Antarctica, generally speaking, it's the job of the home country to investigate their own. This was signed into law alongside the Antarctic Treaty of 1959. But generally speaking though, it's rare that law enforcement gets involved or any major investigation occurs. In one rare circumstance in 1996, a fight broke out at the McMurdo station between two individuals, resulting in one worker attacking the other with a hammer. This incident marked the first time that the FBI had to get involved in a case involving the Antarctic. Despite this fact, however, like usual, very few details about the case were ever divulged, which, if you haven't noticed by now, seems to be a very common theme. This theme gets a hell of a lot more disturbing when you factor in just how open of an issue SA has been on the continent. So much so that in 2022, the NSF openly acknowledged the problem with a 274-page report, citing the issues of SA harassment and stalking as ongoing and continuous. In one disturbing quote, one woman revealed that on her first day at McMurdo Station, she was told to stay clear of one building unless she wanted to be This report also points to another situation where a woman had become so perturbed she had begun carrying around a hammer as a part of her day-to-day. -day. And if you read further, this appears to be a common practice at McMurdo Station. 
Within a survey of individuals within the program, 72% of women agreed that this issue was widespread, while nearly 50% of males agreed as well. And given these statistics, you'd expect a few charges to pop up. But disturbingly, it appears that most of these things just get swept under the rug. NPR's Joe Palka has been reading through the 273-page report and is here in the studio to tell us about it. Hey, Joe. Hey, Ari. What are some of the revelations in the report? Well, one of the things that jumps out at you is how pervasive this problem seems to be. They quoted one of the people they interviewed as saying, every woman I know down there has had an assault or harassment experience that occurred on ice. On ice is what they call working down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a sentiment that they uh, heard from many, many different people. The report also said that many people didn't trust the officials they were supposed to report to when they had a problem because they thought, A, they might be re there might be reprisals, or B, they were thinking that the, these people were more interested in protecting the agencies mm. than protecting the people. Is there something about working in Antarctica that makes this more of a problem? Well, I've been to Antarctica, and it's very remote. And... Uh, it, even though the internet has made it smaller, it's just not a place that you can walk down the street and see anybody. Um, much of the year, these bases are totally inaccessible. The sun disappears for months in the winter, and that means the staff doesn't have anywhere to go or anyone to talk to. I spoke with Madeline Nash. She's an associate dean at the Australia National University. She studies harassment in, Australia, in Australia's Antarctic program. You're so isolated and so detached from the sort of normal roles of society that often it makes it sort of, for lack of a better word, it makes it easier to get away with inappropriate behavior that probably wouldn't be condoned, you know, back in normal life. So imagine if it's your supervisor doing the harassing, harassing it's not like you can go down the hall and complain. That supervisor, supervisor might be thousands of miles away, miles away. Has a problem like this been documented before? Well, Nash says many people who've worked in Antarctica know it's an ongoing issue. Given the strange legal circumstances on the continent and the apparent isolation, it's pretty clear that what happens in Antarctica stays in Antarctica. And this issue of maintaining law and order gets even more chaotic when you hypothetically throw out a scenario where you have two people working at the same base from two different home countries. Given the stipulations of the Antarctic Treaty, a matter of foul play would potentially become an issue of international diplomacy. Throughout the years, there remains one case that encapsulates these issues perfectly. The year is 2000, and the story takes place at the South Pole. Working there during this time was an Australian astrophysicist named Rodney Marks, a man who was dedicated to his job, but known for having a rock and roll exterior, according to colleagues. His fiance, Sonia Walter, took a job as a maintenance specialist at the same Antarctic station so she could be there with him. Rodney had been working at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Research Station. He was a part of the University of Chicago's Antarctic Submillimeter Telescope and Remote Observatory Project, also known as ASTRO for short. The Amundsen Scott South Pole Station is run by the National Science Foundation, a U.S. government entity, though some of the work is subcontracted to the aerospace company Raytheon Polar Services. By all accounts, Rodney had done quite well at his job, with co-workers praising his abilities throughout his time there. He was also known for going above and beyond, teaching an astronomy class on the side at the station, which included students from all sorts of backgrounds. It was clear that Rodney had a passion for life, but unfortunately, it would not be long before his own life would be cut short. By May of 2000, Rodney had been working at Astro for about a year, and on May 11th, he was walking between the remote observatory and the base when he began to feel unwell. 
His breathing was labored, his vision was weakened, and upon arriving back at the base, he went to bed early, hoping whatever was going on would clear up as he slept. However, at 5.30 the next morning, as he lay next to Sonia, he woke up with a terrible burn in his stomach and found himself vomiting blood. From here, he would make his first visit to the station's doctor, Robert Thompson, who, not knowing what was wrong with him and had no contact with the outside world for advice, told him to rest more. Rodney would come back a second time later that day with worsening symptoms. The burn that was in his stomach just continued to get worse, and his eyes had become so sensitive that he needed to wear sunglasses. Dr. Thompson noted that Rodney had become agitated, and as he could not pin down a single cause for the patient's symptoms, chalked it up to anxiety, administered a sedative. Rodney returned to bed and rested a while longer, but his symptoms only continued to worsen. By the third time Rodney visited the doctor, he was so distressed, he was hyperventilating and combative. Dr. Thompson injected Rodney with an antipsychotic called Haldol in order to regain control of him. He laid back and his breathing slowed, and it seemed, at first, as if he was getting better. But unfortunately, Rodney went into cardiac arrest shortly after. The station's trauma team was summoned, and after 45 minutes of unsuccessful resuscitation attempts, Dr. Thompson declared Rodney dead at 6.45 p.m. Initially, it was thought that Rodney had died of natural causes. Unfortunately for the investigation, it would be several months before Rodney's body could be flown to New Zealand for an autopsy. In the interim, Rodney's remains were put in a body bag and stored in a cold area. However, some of his co-workers thought he deserved a more dignified resting place until his body could be transported. So several of them worked together to create a casket and then they held a ceremony at the South Pole. Once Rodney was finally flown out of the continent to the mainland, the circumstances surrounding his death would be cast in a completely different light. A post-mortem examination easily determined that the cause of death was methanol poisoning. Methanol, also known as wood alcohol, is a solvent that despite its name is definitely not meant to be ingested. Taking in as little as 10 milliliters of methanol can cause permanent blindness and a dose of 30 milliliters is fatal. Yet Rodney, shockingly, had consumed an estimated 150 milliliters of methanol. 150 milliliters is effectively the same as a small wine glass, and many people who discuss this case bring this detail up. The question, of course, was how this chemical got into Rodney's body in the first place. While there was noted to have been large amounts of methanol at the base as a part of their cleaning supplies, there was no clear reason why he would have consumed this much. And at the time, Rodney Marx's situation posed a very unique set of circumstances that had never really been experienced in the same way. To back things up for a moment, Rodney Marx was an Australian citizen and New Zealand native. He was working at a United States research facility. Given the multi-jurisdictional environment, getting any kind of true investigation would be next to impossible. Because as fate would have it, the NSF and Raytheon would stonewall any kind of investigation into the matter. As the investigation would run its course from the New Zealand end, they would hit roadblock after roadblock as their opposition tried to bury the Marks case every chance they got. For one, an initial physician's report was submitted in July of 2000, and it claimed, quote, there is no evidence to point to homicide, accidental poisoning, environmental toxicity, or infection. Yet, somehow they had magically come to this conclusion and drafted a report before an actual autopsy had even been carried out. And additionally, it would take the New Zealand investigation three years just to get the names of the people who were working at the base at the time, as the NSF and Raytheon would not provide that information. Then, when the detective finally got his hands on the names, Raytheon and the NSF only agreed to distribute a questionnaire to their employees after they got to curate which questions were allowed. Furthermore, they heavily emphasized to their employees that the questionnaire was optional. As a result, only 13 of Rodney's co-workers out of the 49 would actually respond. 
which is rather jarring when, by all accounts, everybody liked Rodney. Furthermore, as the investigation unfolded, New Zealand's coroner was blocked multiple times from getting any kind of additional interview with the doctor that had treated Rodney. But that being said, the final coroner's report was released to the public in 2008, concluding that there was no evidence to support, well, anything. And ultimately, no verdict was reached as to what caused his death, leaving us to only speculate. Now, as we dive into the theories about what may have happened to Rodney, I'll say that theorizing about this incident is rather tricky. Given the murky details and lack of cooperation from involved parties, it's pretty much just pure speculation. The first theory that often gets thrown out in regards to discussion of this case is this idea that Rodney unintentionally drank the methanol as a result of brewing his own moonshine. And while it's true that the station had its own distillery, Apparently, this distillery was tested and came back negative for methanol. I would posit that it's much more likely that if this were an accident, Rodney just mixed up two bottles on his desk, as he was known to have quite a dirty workspace. But I'll add, it's one thing to take just a sip as opposed to consuming an entire glass. The other key person of interest in regards to this case was Dr. Robert Thompson, the man who treated Rodney. Some of his actions were very questionable, such as injecting him with Haldol, where upon shortly after, Rodney passed away. To quote an article from Men's Journal, While Marks lay dying, his potential lifeline was sitting dormant in the corner of the room. An Ectochem blood analyzer, its single tiny lithium-ion battery had died, and therefore the machine lost its calibration every time it was turned off. Once turned back on, it took nine hours to recalibrate. Thompson had known about the malfunction, even reported it to Raytheon, but for some reason never attempted to fix it and decided against simply leaving it on. It was by no means a necessary piece of equipment in the physician's day-to-day -day duties, but it was there for a reason. Emergencies just like this one. Raytheon and the NSF obviously refused to cooperate, but that appears to be a part of a larger pattern of behavior when it comes to questionable incidents happening in the South Pole. While investigators were skeptical of intentional poisoning, if this were some contrived plot, one can only question the motivation. But obviously when you factor in all the other outbursts that have happened at various stations in the past over the tiniest things, it certainly opens the door of possibility. Another thing that comes off as odd is that Rodney's co-workers reported after his death that he was well-liked, but it seems that only 13 of them cooperated with the investigation in any way. And it's definitely surprising to read up on this case and not see a single statement from someone like the fiancé. While she did give evidence at the hearings, she has refused to give interviews about Rodney's death, but in a rare exception in 2004, she admitted she had returned to a job at Palmer Research Station where her job, ironically enough, was keeping track of chemicals and cleaning equipment used on base. And perhaps the final strange detail that's never really fully been settled was the fact that there were various needle marks that were found on Rodney's arm. Well, we know at least one mark could have come from the doctor. Multiple? Once again, there's a hell of a lot more questions than we have answers. This is Barely Sociable. Have a good night.